And if there's one thing that needs to go out the window when you're a parent, it's perfectionism because, you know, babies are experts at throwing us for a loop. So I would give myself permission to just roll with it. You know, if my child isn't sleeping in the cot in the other room, bring the cot in with me. Fortunately, I learned that fairly early on. I'm glad that I did. But the amount of time I spent worrying about, should I really do that? I don't know if it's right. That could be dangerous. Well, we were doing this safely. If I could simply tell younger me, whether it's about sleep, food, play, getting dirty, any topic out there, just relax a bit because you're going to figure it out and your child is going to be your best teacher more than any other expert out there could ever possibly be. And we're rolling. Welcome to the Parenting Truths podcast. Today, I'm joined by author of Peaceful Discipline, Sarah Moore. Thanks for joining me, Sarah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I, I was keen to chat to you today because I love the content you put out on social media, specifically Instagram. You're so consistent with the content you put out. I think you've posted over 3,000 times on Instagram. So there's so much helpful free content out there for parents to tap into. You share about gentle parenting, attachment, trauma recovery, and interestingly, you sometimes touch on improv comedy, which um, you mentioned in your book as well. So I'm keen to dive into that today, if that's okay. Um, But can we start by talking about what motivates you to keep showing up every day and helping parents with the content that you share? Absolutely. So first of all, I am amused to hear that I have posted 3000 times. I didn't even know I had done that. And I think maybe I need to balance another hobby into my life besides Instagram. But um, as for motivation, honestly, it is really just a desire to create a safer, more peaceful, more connection based world for my own child, as well as for your kids, Tom, and every other child on the planet, because I see so much pain, so much heartbreak, so many hard things happening in the world that I truly believe that those of us who feel called to do so have to be a force for good to help balance some of that stuff, to give our kids a chance for a bright, happy, thriving future. And in terms of the drivers behind that, um, is it does it come from your own upbringing or is it something you've fallen into later on in life? It's really a combination thereof. I okay. was raised by uh, parents who were divorced and they had okay. night and day parenting styles. My dad was very authoritarian and my mom was very permissive. And although right. they both loved me in their own ways, and they both did the very best they could with the tools and the resources they had, I, growing up, knew that there had to be something else other than these two extremes. So although it was more at a subconscious level, I knew that I wanted to do something differently for my own child. And I don't say that as a knock on my parents. They were doing the best they could at the time. However, we now have information about brain science and child development that simply didn't exist when I was a kid. So I want to do better now that we know better, as the adage goes. And then in my own parenting, really the hallmark moment, if you will, and I talk about it in the preface of Peaceful Discipline, was when my daughter was four months old. So she was itty bitty. We went to her standard well check at her pediatrician's office, and he asked me, how's sleep going? And I answered truthfully, she's up every couple of hours, but holistically, she's getting plenty of sleep, so I'm not worried about it. And he looked me in the eye and he said, you are ridiculous. Don't ever go to her when she cries. Let me know when you're ready to get serious about parenting. Well, oh, wow. I froze, you know, the nervous system can go into fight or flight or, you know, the other options. I absolutely froze. And by the way, Flash forward, we did switch pediatricians into somebody who was much more aware, (laughs) current on the science and the research of being responsive to children. But in that moment, I can now look back with incredible gratitude because I did indeed get very serious about parenting. And after 20 years in the corporate world, being a new mom, you know, I was an older mom, as they say, but being a new mom, I said, I want to help empower other parents because I know how prevalent 
this type of guidance is and I know how wrong it is. So I'm going to get the certifications. I'm going to write the book. I'm going to start Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting. I'm going to do everything I can so that even if one other family someday says, I've got this research now that I happen to find from Sarah or from Tom or anybody else out there, I now know I can push back on that type of feedback from an expert and do better yeah. for my child. So that's when it became very real for me as a parent. Because often those conversations with the pediatrician, the majority of parents, that's just going to send them down an avenue that comes with lots of stress, lots of frustration, where more often than not, when we take a step back, it comes down to having the awareness to set realistic expectations for everything when it comes to parenting. But certainly the newborn sleep in those early days is tough. Like we've got an almost seven month old, we're going through it right now. But having that awareness of what's realistic does make it a, a lot easier, doesn't it? It certainly does, especially since we know there are so many gentle and responsive, while still evidence-based ways to support our babies to, you know, sleep better, develop secure attachment, you know, all of the things that they need. It's not just an exercise in self-sacrifice. There are ways that we can show up for our children while still doing the best we can to muddle through, but not really feeling awful in the meantime either. Absolutely. Um, so we hear lots of talk about positive discipline, parenting without punishment. Are you able to talk about what specifically peaceful discipline means to you and how you feel, obviously through your book, that can help parents? Absolutely. So I intentionally chose this title because discipline is such a loaded word and that's a strong way, word isn't like, it we really chose the word you know I, peaceful discipline <laughs> yeah peaceful discipline basically came to me like sarah you're gonna write yeah. the book it's gonna be called this but discipline is such a loaded word and when i say hey tom should i discipline you or you know whatever most of us go oh no thank you i don't want that we have because we have this negative association with it when we have to remember that discipline comes from the root word disciple which means to teach or to be taught. And there is nothing inherently negative or painful or difficult about learning. And so my reminder yeah. by adding the word peaceful is twofold. Number one, we want to be peaceful in the way that we are teaching our children. But perhaps even more importantly, we want our children to perceive it as peaceful. Because it's not about how we're trying to be. It's about how they perceive, whether they feel emotionally safe, whether they feel like they're in a place where they can learn from us, whether they feel securely attached, all of those things. So it's a reminder to all of us, discipline is supposed to be a peaceful, connection-based learning process. Yeah. And have you found that that's evolved for you over time as a mother? Because your, your little one, I say little, is nine years old now, is that right? That is right. And so our oldest is five. And I think from the day he turned five, that throws in a whole new world of challenges. You know, he's struggling um, to listen a lot more now. And there's a far more, he seems to be far more consciously aware in the decisions he's making. Um, you know, he goes to school, he's got his own little life going on. So have you found as a parent, you've had to constantly ev evolve and roll with the times as your little ones got older when it comes to discipline? Absolutely. In fact, I often say that today I am the best parent for the child I had yesterday. Yesterday, I made lots of mistakes. Yesterday, I didn't know what I needed to know. But in hindsight, I'm a great parent all the time. But in the moment, I absolutely struggle. I absolutely wonder how in the world am I going to handle the situation peacefully? <laughs> because guess what? I'm still human. I still get frustrated. I still have moments where, be it family of origin stuff, or I'm tired, or I'm hungry, or God forbid, combination thereof, that stuff still comes up. We're still human. We're still real. So yeah, it's an evolution. And I don't pretend for a moment to be perfect. In fact, you'll probably get a kick out of this. But when I told my daughter about a year and a half ago that I was writing a book, she looked me in the eye and she asked ever so innocently, Mama, is it about how to make mistakes because you're so good at that? And <laughs> I laughed and thought, oh, on one hand, ouch. But on the other hand, 
I'm glad she sees that I am fallible. And hopefully she sees how I repair from my mistakes, how I grow and learn from them. But long story short, Tom, we're all works in progress. And I don't pretend to yeah. have it 100% of the time either. And I think there's a, a misconception. People that um, write these books and share this type of content are permissive parents. But I think at the foundation, it's so important to let people know that, you know, everyone loses it. And it's there's also a healthy part of a relationship to show our little ones that we can lose it and then we can apologize and then we can model repair and let them know that people can make mistakes and still be okay as opposed to being you know a consistent level um which isn't human <laughs> <laughs> exactly robotic parenting is not the book i wrote right <laughs> no so on that note, actually, do you have any tips for parents that do struggle with their child's behavior and are constantly finding themselves frustrated and very low on patience? Yeah, I've got a section in the book that I talk about, and I'll extrapolate on it a little bit here. But okay. for, for those of us who find ourselves in a chronic state of heightened stress with our children, yep. One of the best things we can do is what I call the HUG process, and it's an acronym, H-U-G. The H stands for hold your reaction. Just think about how do I want my child to see me in this moment? It's as if I'm holding up a mirror and I get to check in with myself. Am I being big and scary and imposing or am I getting down on their level? What are they seeing in me right now? The U stands for understand their perspective. Now, this one could be a conversation unto itself, but that might include everything from curiosity. We do know that the adage is all behavior is communication. So what yeah. is it my child is feeling? What is it my child is needing? Odds are pretty good that the surface behavior has very little to do with what's happening under the surface. So how can, how can I get curious about what's really going on for them and motivating them to do whatever it is that seems to be a consistent struggle for us. Also, we could weave in elements of child development. Understanding their perspective might mean maybe, just maybe, and I've been there, so I'm not judging anybody, maybe I have unrealistic expectations for my child. Maybe even at nine years old, I look at her and think, She's incredibly eloquent. She can do all sorts of things. She knows how to tie her shoes. Therefore, wrong assumption, her brain must work just like mine does when it comes to decision making and planning for the future and all that. So maybe as the adult, I need to do the research to go, oh, wait, her prefrontal cortex isn't going to develop for another 15, 20 years to be at its full ability. And by the way, we're still evolving no matter how old we get. So yeah. understanding what's normal for child development can be really helpful so that we're not putting these unrealistic expectations on our children. And then the G finally stands for give them grace to be human. I'm in my 40s, and as I mentioned, I mess up regularly. Just the other day, colossal mess up. I, I was modeling for my child how to do it wrong, and it would be so incredibly hypocritical of me to hold her to a higher standard than I hold myself. So sometimes I just get to look at her and say, you're having a hard day. I understand that. Perhaps you need more sleep. Perhaps you need better nutrition. Perhaps you need more time and sunshine, whatever it might be. So in any case, uh, giving my child grace to be human is a huge part of realizing there's no way I can expect her to be perfect when I myself don't model perfection. So to yeah. the extent that I can relinquish the need for perfect behavior all the time, it's only going to set us up for more understanding and more mutual connection and compassion. Yeah, I think as parents as well, we can expect our kids to be that consistent level of calm, especially when we're doing our best to organise fun activities, just say, for example, a trip to the beach or a trip to Legoland. We just assume our child is going to be grateful and bouncing off the ceiling when we get there and then if it doesn't go as planned we start thinking they're ungrateful and think you know th things just can escalate but as adults we sometimes wake up and we have hard days don't we but we've got 
the ability to do things to change that. You know, we can go outside, we can do a bit of exercise, we can actually make conscious decisions where our little ones are still very reliant on us to help them when they're struggling. Yes. And Tom, I love that you bring up the point about changing what we need to change. I spoke with Dr. Ross Green a while ago, and he taught me that many of our parenting struggles are actually predictable. So Mm. it's enlightening insofar as maybe as a parent, I'm noticing every night before dinner, it's just conflict. You know, everybody's tired and hungry and I'm tired of having these before dinner conflicts every single night when I want it to be a peaceful time. Well, if I can consciously predict tonight at dinner might be hard again because it's been hard nine out of 10 nights in the past, you know, couple of, uh, well, that'd be 10 days. There's my math skill for you. (laughs) Um, But if I can say, you know what, maybe there's something I can tweak here. Perhaps we move snack a little bit later in the afternoon. Perhaps I move dinner up a little bit. Maybe there's something I can do that I can change so that this doesn't have to be a conflict anymore. We are incredible creatures of habit, especially as adults, but sometimes we hold on to our habits with such rigidity that we simply expect someone's going to come in and wave a magic wand and it's not going to be a problem anymore, when really we do have incredible power to change just about anything that is a predictable struggle for us. Yeah, it's a constant evolution. And it's interesting you gave the dinner time example because we're having that at the moment because we've just started weaning our youngest obviously when our oldest who's five comes home from school he's very hungry obviously my wife and I have got a week so there's like three different expectations to manage three people or four people that are hungry obviously our youngest who's six months just wants to throw food around the uh, around the dining room but um so we obviously acknowledge that. I think it, there was four very stressful nights. So we just tweak things a little bit. A little bit. We brought um, dinner time forward. Now at the moment when our son comes home, often he'll eat first. It's not ideal because we enjoy, enjoy eating together. But just for now, obviously, if he's super hungry after school, there's no reason he can't eat. And it just triggered a thought then way back when our son was three bath time struggles which I know a lot of parents experience really weren't bath times weren't working in the evening so we mixed it up and we decided to have bath as a fun activity in the afternoon for a couple of months because it worked there was less stress because the expectation of an evening bath is to rush through it and get to bedtime so we could actually just relax a little bit and that really worked so that's a good tip for anyone that's struggling the same with bedtime we assume that bedtime needs to run in a certain order, but we've mixed that up in the past. So yeah, it's a constant evolution and there's no single way or one size fits all is there for a family. So well said, Tom. I love the examples you shared and those are all things I have done in my own parenting as well. So you're you're yeah. speaking gold to me right now. <laughs> so one thing you touch on is, um, or you talk about quite a lot actually, is highly sensitive children or strong-willed children. So I'm sure a lot of parents listening has a strong-willed child. What challenges do you feel parents face with a strong-willed child and, and how can they sort of navigate through the highs and lows of parenting a child who's strong-willed? Great question. Yeah, one of the most consistent struggles with strong-willed children is actually it's a couple of things that come up for me. Number one is we know that there are going to be more battles because strong will by definition is really kind of black and white thinking, I am right and you are wrong. And whether I'm five years old and have five years of life experience or you're 35 and you have 35 years of life experience, either way, we come to an impasse on such a regular basis that it is now predictable and it is predictably frustrating for us. And we start to have this expectation as parents that here we go for another battle. But interestingly, I don't know what comes up in your body when I say, here we go for another battle. But even as I say that hypothetically right now, I feel my muscles tense up. My breathing gets shorter. My body is preparing to go into fight or flight mode. So one of the things I can do from a parent-centric perspective is notice that about my body and see what I can do to relax my whole demeanor 
Because one thing we do know, and I talk about this a little bit in Peaceful Discipline, is that mirror neurons are powerful. We literally pick up each other's emotional state. So if I come in, teeth gritted, bent, uh, fists clenched, shoulders up to my child and say, all right, it's time for bath, guess what? My child is gonna pick that up even if they were feeling peaceful. And next thing you know, we are primed for a battle. So knowing that we ourselves are the only ones that we can control, it's not necessarily about changing the child. It's about getting curious about what am I bringing into this? Now, many people are gonna say, yeah, but it is a battle every time. Yeah, that's true too. I'm not dismissing that. But here's the interesting thing about strong-willed children. Oftentimes, and I realize this is a paradigm shift and it's kind of a tough pill to swallow for some of us, but sometimes the children who are the most strong-willed look at us as their special big person. And if they could put words to it, they might say, wow, my mom or dad is so strong-willed. Every time I have these big feelings, they push back. And it's really interesting to think that they're thinking the same things about us if they could put it in those words. So one of the best things we can do, and that they often need more than a heavy-handed firm approach, more than stronger boundaries, more than the rigidity that we might inadvertently be bringing into that conversation, is oftentimes they need us to soften. And it doesn't mean that we simply give in to everything they say. It doesn't mean that we throw all of our boundaries out the window. It's not about that at all. But softening might look like, and I'll continue with the bath time example that you brought up earlier, it might look like instead of me focusing on the bath, the thing that has to get done right now, you know, like this little box of activity that has to happen, instead, I might take bath time to the couch. And what I mean by that is I might say, hey, let's go sit and have a chat for a couple of minutes. I noticed bath time has seemed really tricky for us for a while. And I want to be peaceful. I want you to enjoy your baths. I'm curious what's going on for you and what might help you feel better about bath time. And even with very little kids, it's amazing how brilliant they are and how often they will have a simple suggestion. For example, well, I'd like a little bit more playtime instead of rushing through it. Oh, you know what? If we were going to have a 15-minute fight about it, I can probably build in five minutes of playtime to make it a win-win for us. And guess what? I just got 10 minutes back in my day. And the only thing I really changed was pausing and softening and getting curious and listening instead of making it about the bath and only about the bath. How does that land yeah. with you as a dad, Tom? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic example. It, it, and it's more about the journey to the bath as well, isn't it? Because often when we have these battles, it's from us going into battle and demanding things on our terms. So it's bath time. Let, let's get up. Let's get our clothes off into the bath. Let's go. Whereas obviously if you actually set the scene a little bit, maybe start talking about bath time half an hour before and like you say be a bit softer and have those chats and try and bake something else into it it becomes a lot more of a seamless journey it might not work every time but obviously there's more chance of that working than just demanding the bath is now which we all know that obviously kids struggle with that don't they because they like to have a sense of control certainly when they're much younger of course, yeah. And the good news about this approach is that it's for all ages. You know, I shared the little kid example because that's kind of where we are in our parenting. But if you have a teenager who is struggling with curfew, if you have, you know, honestly, a, a spouse or a parenting partner, this is this is never expires. Yeah. When we soften and say, I'm curious what's going on for you, help me understand, people's guard will come down and they will share with you Here's what's going on underneath the surface. I don't feel the need to battle you if I feel like you're working to understand me. Yeah. Yeah, I loved what you said about going into battle because naturally I just pictured going into a boxing ring <laughs> when it's never going to end well, is, is it, if, uh, if that's what you're picturing. But yeah, that's a great way of reframing it. Thank you for that. So one thing I did want to touch on was the 
the storytelling and the improv comedy that you touch on in your book and also on social media. Are you allowed to, are you able to talk a little bit about that and how parents can utilize that in their parenting day to day? I'm happy to. So I have good news for everybody who's listening and watching right now. I talk about this concept called story teaching and some people automatically freak out and go, I'm not creative. That's not going to be for me. I need to change the channel now. When good news, <laughs> stay with us. I promise you, if you have a brain, you have a part of your brain called the hippocampus and your hippocampus is automatically telling stories all day long, every day. And the same is true for your children. The hippocampus is the brain's natural storyteller. So there's no test, there's no quiz, you don't have to remember which part of the brain it is. But when we use stories to teach, and by the way, they don't have to be stories that you make up, they can be, but they can simply be a retelling of a movie that you've watched, a particular scene that's related to whatever topic you want to cover. It could be something from a book, it could be something from real life. It doesn't have to be hard for you as a parent. But what we want to do is have some sort of a story in the child's brain where they can say, ah, yes, I remember that. And the reason why they remember it is that it has an emotional anchor. It's not just random information. Oh, that day I took out the trash. Well, who cares, right? But when I say that day I took out the trash, this is my improv skill coming out because I'm making up this example on the fly and I have no idea mm -hmm. what I'm gonna say 10 seconds from now. But I took out the trash and you came with me, child. And the neighbor's dog got out and started running towards us barking. That was scary. So here's an emotional anchor, a scary moment. And what we did is we called for the neighbor. The neighbor came out and got their dog. And then I picked you up, pretending it's a little kid. How did you feel when I picked you up? Oh, I felt safer. I felt better. Okay, safer. That's another emotional anchor. And what we can do is we can extrapolate the situation across other moments in life that might cause fear for the child. So for example, maybe it's going to sound completely unrelated, but it's not. Maybe that child is going off to a new school and guess what? They feel fear. They feel nervousness. They feel anxiety. We might say, hey, remember that situation with the dog? Doesn't sound related, but... Do you remember how we dealt with it? Do you remember how at first it felt scary, but in reality, nothing bad happened. And then when I picked you up and held you, you felt safe again. Guess what? Trying new things can be scary sometimes, but you have emotional support. You will have me holding you as soon as you are done with the day. And you're gonna have lots of people who can hold you emotionally throughout the day. And that kind of safety is gonna feel familiar to your body again. And all I'm doing is taking one story that happened in real life and taking the theme into another situation. And one of the things I talk about in the book is that, again, two good things about story teaching. It, one is that it's for all ages. Even as adults, we can still use this tool to help build resilience and confidence and lower anxiety and things like that. But it's okay. also for all time. We can use it for the future. The example I just shared was a future example. You're going to be going to the school. This is going to be a little bit scary, but here's how we're going to deal with it. And notice I always talk about what we're going to do specifically to deal with the situation. So if this were a real example, I might talk through what safety is going to feel like at school. But yeah. for the sake of our discussion now, this is something that I'm doing in preparation for something that's coming up. I can use in the moment stories. Maybe I'm at the playground with my child and I notice my child picks up a handful of pebbles and they're contemplating tossing those pebbles at the other kids. I can kind of swoop in gently and say, hey, do you remember that TV show we watched where when Daniel Tiger or Bluey or whoever felt like they were getting mad, what did they do? And you can help trigger that hippocampus with the child and say, oh, right, they did this thing but you're guiding your child in a way that's emotionally accessible and memorable for them so they can drop the pebbles and move on without you having to come in as the, you know, oh, so wise adult saying, look, I'm smarter than you and I'm going to shame you for even thinking about harming anybody. All of that stuff that ultimately backfires because there's no emotional anchor. Plus it can feel crummy to the child. 
And then lastly, I can use story teaching to help heal from tricky situations or traumatic situations that have happened in the past. I can help the child process and come up with what's called a coherent narrative to help build their resiliency and their knowledge that they can handle hard things and they can heal from hard things instead of just having to suppress all of the tension that might have built up in their bodies. So I have lots of sample stories in the book, but honestly, there are a million different ways to do it. I outline specific steps as to how it works, but I love yep. that it's so widely accessible for all of us and that it doesn't have to be nearly as hard as it sounds. Yeah, th that's just reminded me, actually. So when our son was two and a half, we went through a phase of about six months where he wanted my wife and I to tell him stories from our past when we were, um, when we were young. And I, I started off by telling him a few um, stories that evoked emotion. So, for example, I was climbing on the garden shed um, and I fell off and hurt myself and had to go to hospital. I remember a story that rings true that I told him when my mum picked me up from school and she told me that our dog had gone missing and how we went on to find him and how that made me feel. So we started off by telling him a couple of stories and then every night for about six months, we rarely read books because he just wanted stories from when we were kids. And even now he can relay the, the highs and lows of my childhood. Um, and this played in very well to when, unfortunately, my son, when he was about three, caught his finger in the door and needed an operation because he crushed his thumb. And obviously he could then recall a lot of times when I'd hurt myself when I was young. Um, the example of falling off the roof when I tripped on some ice and things like that. So it's a great way of connecting with our kids as well, isn't it? And obviously your example works perfectly. Um, and if parents are struggling to come up with examples, just think back to your own own childhood because um, you've got a whole library of stories there that I'm sure will um, ignite the imagination of your little one. Yes, and Tom, I love that you spent the time, that you invested the time in telling him those stories because when his poor little finger got caught and I, I feel for him. I know he recovered, but oh, what a tough thing for a little guy to go through. Yeah. But he already had a roadmap, thanks to your stories of dad went through this hard thing. It might not have been exactly this, but it was close enough. And if he can make it through, I can make it through. And if he didn't have your stories, he might feel like he was the first three-year-old to have ever gotten an injury, period. And how scary yeah. that would feel. But instead, you gave him the gift of knowing if he can recover, I can recover too. Absolutely. Um, so one thing I'm doing with all of my guests is asking them three quick fire questions. Um, so I try to keep it quick fire, but feel free to um, dive in and elaborate if you need to. Um, so question one is, knowing what you know now, what parenting advice would you give yourself before you became a parent? Brilliant question. <laughs> comes to mind for me is I would tell myself, learn how to relax a bit more. Yeah. Because I am, you know, a self-proclaimed, I shouldn't say perfectionist. I have a tendency towards perfectionism. And if there's one okay. thing that needs to go out the window when you're a parent, it's perfectionism because, you know, babies are experts at throwing us for a loop. So <laughs> I would give myself permission to just roll with it. You know, if my child isn't sleeping in the cot in the other room, bring the cot in with me. Fortunately, I learned that fairly early on. I'm glad that I did. But the amount of time I spent worrying about, should I really do that? I don't know if it's right. That could be dangerous. Well, we were doing this safely. If I could simply tell younger me, whether it's about sleep, food, play, getting dirty, any topic out there, just relax a bit because you're going to figure it out and your child is going to be your best teacher more than any other expert out there could ever possibly be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the one thing you feel you need to work on as a parent? Let's see. Would you like the top hundred things I could work on? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. Um, short answer. I think... One thing that I really want to work on right now, particularly as my daughter encroaches on being double digits years old in just a matter of a few short weeks here, just being present. 
You know, I think I, I really took for granted when she was younger that she was always going to be little, even though intellectually I knew that she wouldn't. Children grow. It's mm. what they do. But now that I realize she is theoretically, although I haven't wrapped my head around this at all, she is theoretically closer to being out the door than she is being a newborn in my arms. It yeah. really makes me want to put down my phone more, close the computer more, you know, schedule fewer non-mandatory things and just say, how can we delight in each other today? How can we just have a good time being together? Because I don't get yesterday back. So presence is something I'm working on right now as she comes up on this big milestone birthday. Yeah. Yeah. That one comes up a lot presence um, when I ask my guest, And I think that's something we can all work on, especially in the world we live in today. It's really hard to detach yourself, isn't it? Especially rolling from the office to downstairs. Um, you know, it, the, it work sort of comes with you, doesn't it, on your phone. So it's really hard to detach. So we need to be more consciously aware of that for sure. Yes. And if you can pick one, uh, what's the best thing for you about being a parent? Such good questions. What comes up for me here <laughs> is seeing joy in my child yeah no matter what the cause is every time i hear her laugh every time i see her smile and she has these beautiful sparkly joyful eyes when i see the joy just rising up into her eyeballs and radiating out on those around her and making it sound like she has lasers she doesn't actually have lasers but you know helping <laughs> having her uh, exude this joy this makes it so worthwhile for me and it just lights me up from the inside out as well to know that the healing work that we are doing tom you're doing it with your children i'm doing it with mine so many others around the world are really prioritizing mental health and connection and peaceful discipline and all of these things to help create children who don't need to be afraid of us and instead feel so emotionally safe that joy can just radiate out of their bodies what an incredible gift that is. So I would say that's number one for me. And I think it's a great reminder for parents when you see that joy, just how young our little ones are, because going back to what we said earlier about expecting too much too soon of our little ones, just the other day, I bought Luca, who's five, um, some bubbles to blow in the garden because the sun's coming out. And just seeing him so excited at chasing the bubbles and, and popping them was just a reminder like, oh yeah, actually he is only a five-year-old. Let's, you know, let's go easy sometimes on him. So that's such an important one. Oh, what a beautiful example. I love that. Well, thank you for joining me today, Sarah. I'm definitely keen to get you back on because there's plenty more that we can, um, we can touch on. Um, but before we sign off, are you able just to let people know where they can find you? Oh, thanks, Sarah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for uh, joining me, Sarah, and we will touch base again very soon. I look forward to it. Thanks so much, Tom. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Bye.